Welcome everybody. Uh, our subject is uh, world coal consumption uh, with an eye on uh, the context of climate change. Uh, reducing coal consumption is certainly an important aspiration of any policymaker interested in confronting climate change, but it's not easy. And I invited our main speaker, uh, Dr. Howard Grunspeck, to talk about the three major uh, countries in the world, uh, China, India, and the United States, and describe what is going on with coal demand and consumption. Uh, and then we have a commentator, uh, uh, our own Nico Safos, who is going to uh, maybe make some comments, but also add uh, some remarks about uh, several other Asian countries and what they are doing in, in terms of uh, coal consumption. <coughs> uh, Dr. Grunspeck is uh, probably known to, to many of you. Uh, he currently is senior energy economist at the MIT Energy Initiative for just about the last year and a half or so. But before that was for 14 years deputy administrator of the EIA, Energy Information Administration. Uh, from where he directed uh, all their operations of energy data and analysis programs, and I think it's essentially held the organization together. Uh, it's still together, though. It's not <laughs> left. So that tells you maybe maybe if you were an empiricist, that would tell you that your statement is not true. <laughs> uh, before that, he held some key positions in the Department of Energy's uh, policy office. Uh, he's also a resident scholar of resources for the future. Uh, was, was a faculty member uh, at the Business School of Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and has some other staff jobs in the government, U.S. International Trade Commission, and the White House uh, domestic policy staff way back in the 78 79. <coughs> uh, Dr. Grossman has a PhD from Yale University in economics. And welcome. Okay. So we've established that I can't hold a job, and we've established that I'm old. So now let's talk about coal. So I'd like to thank you. No one would say after 40 years that you can't hold a job. All right. Well, anyway, thanks, Will. I uh, appreciate the uh, invitation. I spoke here like two years, years ago, same room. Uh, but I'd like to share some thoughts on the future use of coal. And I look forward to hearing from mine. Friend and, and part time colleague, because I'm a non resident at CSIS. And in addition to being here, Nick is there. So it's a very uh, assessment relationship, and he follows markets closely. So earlier this year, the Brookings Program on Energy and Climate published my paper on the future of coal in the United States. And that's something I know a lot about. As part of that effort, I considered uh, export market for U.S. thermal and metallurgical coal. And that led me to look at some of the other big coal-consuming countries. And uh, I would also note that the Brookings Program also recently uh, issued a paper on coal in India, I think it just came out last month, uh, co-authored by uh, Rahul Tonga, a fellow at Brookings India, and Samantha Gross, a fellow at Brookings up the street, I guess. I think they just call it Brookings. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and that's a good source of information as well. So, so coal, I think, you know, remains an important global energy source, although its share of the total energy use in all three countries in the world probably has already peaked. Uh, in the United States, coal's been on a downward trajectory in absolute terms for the past decade, uh, driven mainly by its displacement in electricity generation by a combination of natural gas and renewables. And that has led to big benefits in terms of the uh, uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, about three-quarters of the reduction that's occurred in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions since 2005 is attributable, in some sense, to coal's uh, declining role in the power sector. Uh, you know, sometimes people talk about, you know, what's low-hanging fruit. Uh, I guess in, in this case, uh, displacement of coal was arguably free fruit. Uh, it was already on the ground, so not only do you not have to stretch had already fallen into your basket, uh, as the market alone provided much of the impetus for the coal displacement. Uh, you know, so there are some challenges. Uh, in, in our discussion this evening, I have to point out some similarity as well as some differences uh, across the US, China, and India in a variety of factors. Uh, 
that have determined recent trends in their coal use and will also contribute to the future outlook. Of course, uh, although some people refer to everything on the EIA website as data, I draw a distinction between things that are actually data that you can kind of, you know, jelly beans that you can count in the jar and things that you're talking about in the future, which are, which are forecasts, uh, which are more uncertain. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both. Uh, so I want to examine similarities and differences. Uh, some of the similarities involve some of the, the, the market factors, you know, advances in renewable generation technologies clearly having an impact everywhere. Uh, definitely exerting a role, uh, pressure on coal's role as a fuel for electricity generation throughout the world. Uh, some of the differences might involve perceived or actual energy security concerns differences related to local air quality, nature of government involvement in coal production and transportation uh, that may affect outcomes. So again, uh, at Will's request, uh, out, I guess I should, yeah, good idea to show some. So outlooks are, outlooks are a part of this thing, but uh, there are also some, I think, facts that we can get to before we get to the outlooks, and that's, that, that's sort of the approach that I have uh, in mind. That's a lot of numbers, I'm not going to go through all of them. But it's 50 plus years of coal demand in India, China, and the world, uh, courtesy of BP. I, now that I'm no longer at EIA, I, I can use whatever I want. Uh, so again, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that data conversions actually matter a lot with respect to energy, particularly for a fuel like coal, where the energy value per ton depends significantly on its, on its grade and strength uh, and the percentage of non-combustible contaminants that are mixed in with the fuel. So if you measure things by, by ton, it's, and you've got half a ton of dirt you know, mixed in with your coal, the dirt's probably not gonna burn uh, for many purposes, but not for all. Uh, it makes sense to look at coal data on an energy content basis rather than a raw tonnage basis. If you're running a train moving coal, you probably don't care that much about the energy content, you care about the raw tonnage. But for these purposes, I think the, the energy content is the way to go. And that's what I'm going to use, although because I want to deal with a variety of different sources, uh, the energy you know, units, standard units, sometimes tons of oil equivalent, sometimes tons of coal equivalent, sometimes BTU, if I go back to EIA, you know, will vary from, from presentation to presentation. So China, India, United States together accounted for more than 70% of uh, world coal use in 2017, with China alone accounting for 50%. Uh, China surpassed the United States as the biggest user back in 1986. By 2017, it was consuming six times uh, what the United States was consuming. In 2015, India surpassed the United States as number two. That's why, even though we're very chauvinistic and you know we're in the United States, but the United States is third on my list here because it's only the third biggest coal consumer. Uh, you know, you can also look at coal use in the leading countries and the world as a percentage of total energy use, and. Uh, you know, coal's share of overall energy use in the three countries provides sort of a different perspective. So even when the U.S. was the world's leading coal consumer, it was only between 18 and 24 percent of, of total U.S. energy over the 1965 to 2015 period. Uh, and recently it slid a lot below that. It's below 15 percent now. And even in periods where coal consumption in China and India was far lower than in the U.S., its share of total energy was significantly higher than coal's share in the U.S. So since 1970, coal's provided between 55 and 60 percent of uh, India's total energy. Uh, you know, coal's share of total energy in China was as high as 80 percent back in 1970, and it's been... Uh, dropping, it declined to 70% by 2010, even as China's overall coal use rose rapidly. So again, when you're looking at the, the share in the economy, in the energy economy versus the absolute amount, you get very different things. The decline in coal's share of energy use in China 
uh, has accelerated since 2010. Coal's use is down under just about 60% in 2017, probably a little bit lower today. Uh, however, it's still, even at 60% down from 70% in 2010, it's still four times the, the share of overall U.S. coal use. And uh, so, again, just some perspective. No, I'm moving it on mine, but not on yours. So I use this in more in the U.S. context. Of course, I'm fairly old, so I, I remember Monty Python. I'll draw some blanks here. But uh, <laughs> there's this wonderful scene of Michael Palin and the parrot, whether it's resting or whether it's dead. And, uh, you know, the question is, uh, you know, when you look at the future outlook, you know, they might ask whether coal use is dying, really resting, or just feeling a bit weak. It's, uh, Described. It's not dead, it's just resting. In fact, you know, I think there's a there's a variety of answers to that. So oh, wrong way because I'm going the way I want to go. So some of the key factors that drive coal use trends and projections. So you have the market stuff. I tried to put you know put in parents, I think, where the thing is more important. Uh, you know, growth in the economies and electricity, cost of technologies, cost of fuels, particularly important in the U.S. because natural gas is much cheaper relative to other fuels in the U.S. than in other places. The technologies have been everywhere. Uh, energy security concerns. Well, it depends how you define energy security, uh, but that's something we can talk about. Local pollution and interest in greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Uh, you know, sometimes the thought is all those things go together. They can go together. Certainly, greenhouse gas reduction, less use of coal, is generally good for local pollution. But if local pollution is your target, it's not clear that greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies are the only way or the best way to go. And there may be conflicts among some of these objectives. You know, the extent of government involvement uh, actually in the coal sector, coal production and coal transport, and policies at all government levels. So there's a lot of different drivers sort of at play here. And, you know, electricity is the dominant use of coal in all the countries. But that's true to a much greater extent in the U.S. than in China and India. So in the U.S., we get in the habit of talking about, you know, as goes coal use and electricity goes total coal use. And it makes perfect sense. You know, it accounts for electricity and heat, and there's really not much of a direct, you know, district heat industry in the United States, so it's really almost electricity. It's just the way the IEA breaks it up. Accounts for 92.5% of coal consumption in the United States. So it is the whole, the whole ball of wax. You know, that is less true in, in China and India. You know, it's, it's still more than half in China. It's nearly two thirds in India. But there are a lot more uses of coal and coal transformation and a lot more uses in final consumption in industry and other places. So you can't take the shortcut I think necessarily of focusing on only what goes on in the electricity sector, although the electricity sector is really important. So that is something I would uh, recommend. You know, there's only limited time, so I, I may not have too much to say about it. I may say a little bit about steel making later on. Which is the thought. But after having said electricity is in everything, electricity is something. So I do want to say that uh, you will notice that if you focus on the growth rates, particularly the, you know, both over the entire period for which BP has data, the last decade, which in BP's terms is 2006 to 16, you notice that U.S. electricity demand was kind of stagnant over this past decade. And, uh, you know, China and India, things were growing at a, at a pretty good clip. In fact, pretty close to how it's been growing 
really since 1985. So, you know, one thing to note is that the declining coal share has a much bigger implication for absolute coal use when overall demand is stagnant than, than when overall demand is growing. So, you know, the U.S. before 2005 had experienced electricity growth of about 2% a year and had, you know, electricity sales been growing at 2% a year in the U.S. since 2005, overall electricity demand would be 24% higher in 2017 than it was in 2005. And, uh, you know, losing market share in a stagnant market has different implications than losing market share in a growing market. And that's something to keep uh, in mind here. India has been kind of supercharged because in addition to rapid growth in electricity use, rapid annual growth, you know, in the last decade, I guess, uh, you know, nearly 7%, coal's share in the electricity mix has actually been growing. So that's a combination of, uh, you know, working the other way in terms of an effect on absolute level of coal use. So I guess still on electricity, I don't want to spend too much time, but, you know, the developments in terms of you know, solar PV module costs and, and, and wind turbine, you know, cost reductions has really been a, an incredible story, I think. And, uh, you know, it, it's having an effect. Uh, this is stuff, by the way, a lot of this, this material I took from Bloomberg New Energy uh, Outlook. Uh, you know, for wind turbines, you know, I'll show on the left-hand side, this probably actually understates the reduction in the cost of wind because the newer wind turbines can operate at a, in a given location. They typically operate at a higher capacity factor than the, than the older technologies. So if you take account both of the cost of the turbine and the fact that you get more generation, you know, under a given wind condition, the cost of generation has actually fallen by more than 32%, you know, on the wind side. And on the PV side, of course, this is the module only, and a lot varies in terms of the system costs, both across countries and between whether you're doing utility scale installation or small scale installation. But again, this is a big driver, and this one is going across the world. So I took the US, again, I. Earlier on, you notice I said, like, we talk about fuel prices, talk about the U.S. And, I, and I, so I took the U.S. here alone. It's very, you know, I mean, you can, you can do prices in the other countries, but it is more difficult because there are a whole variety of different coal prices in India. And, but generally, the natural gas prices are higher in those places, and the coal prices sort of all over the place a little bit because coal it depends on exactly where you are physically. The transportation cost is very high. Uh, India, there are all kinds of different arrangements uh, between the state-owned coal producer and has sort of different prices in the auction than it has in a contract market and all kinds of things. Also in China, I think you'll see different prices. So, I, so just in the U.S., I just tried to illustrate coal and natural gas prices, what's happened. And, uh, you know, so these are dollars per million BTU back to those good old EIA units. And uh, the other thing I did is I calculated 0.7 times the gas price divided by the coal price. Because you actually use less BTUs, you know, in a, in, a, in a typical gas plant in the United States to generate a kilowatt hour of electricity than you do BTUs of coal to generate a kilowatt hour. So the actual sort of fuel cost comparison is roughly approximated by this 0.7 you know, times the natural gas price divided by the coal price. And you can see that, you know, 2005, that, that was like, you know, almost 400%. So it was like, clearly gas, even by 0.7, was much more expensive than running a coal plant, if you could run either one. But as you get down to 2009, the shale revolution starts to come into play. And all of a sudden, you're talking in the, you know, in the hundreds, uh, 150 or less, sometimes under 100, 
And, uh, you know, that has definitely moved things a lot toward coal. There are other considerations beyond fuel costs that generally favor uh, natural gas generation relative to coal fire generation. You need less people operate the plant, you know, you, need, you know, you can ramp it up and down faster, all kinds of benefits. So you do not have to get that, 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 that ratio does not have to go below 100% to make you prefer running coal to gas. And in fact, you know, tremendous interest in that. So the prices have definitely moved things. So let me move on to energy security, which is like a, like when we talked before this thing began about Iran, you know, but uh, we're not going to solve that one. And, and who knows what energy security is. But one thing people do look at is, is reliance on energy imports. And that varies really dramatically across fuels and countries. Right? So you look at, you look at oil, the, the famous thing that everyone talks about in terms of energy imports. And I tried to calculate both the consumption levels, and I mean, it's pretty easy to find that data, and the net imports divided by consumption, kind of net import reliance. Which again, it's not a great measure, but it's a measure that a lot of people look at. And again, given that we're just one factor here, I wanted to do that. And you can see that in the U.S., you know, you know and, and we were going crazy back in the when I first joined EIA. You know, it was like the U.S. was importing 60% of its oil, and uh, you know, our production was falling, our consumption was rising, and and all kinds of policies, you know, were being pursued, you know, where, you know, this is when some of the policies favoring, let's use more ethanol, let's have, you know, hydrogen powered vehicles, maybe coming back again, uh, let's, let, let, let's, let's get serious about fuel economy standards, you know, we're addicted to Middle Eastern oil, let's, you know, all, all these things were, were being done because we were importing 60%, you know, 60% of our oil supplies came from uh, overseas. I mean, Europe was really doing crazy stuff. I mean, they were, I mean, they were, they were like saying, let's switch to diesel because that will save us, you know, that will reduce our oil consumption. And then it was, wasn't so good in terms of local air pollution. <laughs> but, you know, they have a big particular problem now in some sense because of that, that transition. But people were willing to do a lot to, to deal with this. Well, again, if you compare the United States to, to China and India, well, the U.S import dependence has come down. It was like on the order of 25% in 2017. It's much lower already. It's probably headed towards zero. It's probably headed toward, toward being the net exporter. Uh, but if you compare to China and India, you know, 75% of, of China's oil comes from abroad. Uh, you know, 85% of India's oil comes from abroad. Again, you can do the same look at, at gas. The U.S. is already a net exporter. Uh, China and India, not quite the same situation as they are with oil, but you know a lot of, of dependence on, on on foreign supplies that will make them think maybe twice about you know shifting toward more dependence on gas. Uh, again, on oil. Uh, sorry, when we get down to coal at the bottom, you know. Among the fossil fuels, that's where these countries, you, you know, are most uh, domestically dependent. And, and India is making great efforts, I think, to increase its thermal coal production and reduce thermal coal imports. They have significant thermal coal resources. They don't have metallurgical coal. So that they'll always be importing. But, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know what you can say about this. The other thing, of course, renewable energy, some of the things we looked at earlier, you know, those are also great potentially from an energy security perspective. And they may also be great from a local pollution perspective and also from a greenhouse gas perspective. So again, but just in looking among how the different countries might look at the, at the relative role of the different fossil fuels, you know, you can see, you know, considerable uh, differences. Uh, I guess one final note on energy security is that, like, you know, one thing you might take away from this, especially with uh, continuing boom in U.S. oil production, is that the U.S. doesn't have an energy security problem. But of course, that doesn't stop, you know, claims being made 
of, from energy security problems. And in particular, the present administration is making the claim that we have to keep more fuel secure sources of electricity generation, which then means coal and nuclear, uh, you know, operating. I, I think it's a pretty bogus argument, you know, as can be seen by lots of things. It can be seen by the fact that if you look across the United States, we have very different generation mixes. You don't find the ones that have high dependence on coal and nuclear being more reliable than the others. The other thing is if you look at the cause of actual outages in the U.S., they all relate or, or predominantly relate to the, to the transmission and distribution system, not to fuel security at the generation level. So again, people can make bad arguments about energy security, but it is a consideration uh, in these things. And I think you see it, you know, in the case of China, just, just one observation, you know, they have continuing great interest in, in coal to liquids. And that's an example of a situation where return, concerns related to energy security are really in conflict with the reduction of energy related carbon dioxide emissions. So, you know, the IEA, we'll see how many of these projects really come to fruition, but they've penciled in about a tripling of coal to liquids capacity uh, between 2017 and 2023. And the fuels producing, produced using CTL could be imported at lower cost with lower CO2 emissions, uh, you know, from foreign sources, uh, suggesting, again, that, that in China, energy security concerns can sometimes, you know, not always, I mean, China's doing a lot that's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but sometimes energy security concerns, hard to explain this, it, it isn't economically driven, uh, you know, it, it, it has to, it's certainly not driven by greenhouse gases, certainly not, so there you go. So local pollution, uh, another concern, you know, combustion of fossil fuels, especially coal, I think, not just including coal, can be an important contributor to air quality concerns. Uh, also emits carbon dioxide emissions. There are some real synergies, you know, in, in tackling local pollutants and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as experienced in the United States. You know, so again, what happened with the displacement of coal from electricity, good for greenhouse gases, good for local pollutants. So the synergies are real, but it's not necessarily the case the yeah, displacement of coal is a preferred strategy for addressing uh, local and regional pollution issues that are typically of greatest concern to populations. So other strategies include control systems that directly target emissions, uh, actions affecting activities other than uh, coal-fired generation, which, which also have a big role, uh, can be maybe preferred. Uh, particularly in societies that are also concerned with maintaining high levels of economic growth and dealing with some energy security type issues. You know, switching from coal to gas more might be problematic for them. Again, switching to renewables might be good for both. You know, so there you go. So, you know, I wanted to get sort of an overall handle on air quality concerns. And there are many different indicators, but the easiest one to get a grip on, and the one that I think most of the focus is on these days, is this very fine particulate matter, uh, PF particle, you know, particulates uh, 2.5 microns uh, or less. Uh, you know, keep in mind there are 25,000 microns in an inch, so these are really small particles. And I, and I guess the concern is that they're able to travel deeply into the respiratory tract. And there's been a lot of, you know, this is not an air pollution seminar, but it's, uh, there's been a lot of concern that it, you know, is associated with all kinds of acute problems and then also associated, you know, with, with what, things like death, uh, heart problems, all, all kinds of really serious uh, medical problems. And uh, the World Health Organization, you know, sets in, has an average ex annual exposure standard to PM 2.5, says it should be you know, less than uh, 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So that, that, that's the World Health Organization definition of clean air. 
Uh, the US EPA standard on an annual basis is maybe 12, but that, that's what you're talking about, way down at the bottom of that vertical scale on the left-hand side. And, you know, this is a map that kind of just, just shows you, you know, well, on an average, the average person in each of these countries. So again, there's tremendous variation within the country, of course. But, you know, what does it look like? And you can see that in the, you know, the US and Canada, Australia, Scandinavia, Iceland, you know, there are a few countries where on average people are, are, are under that World Health Organization standard. You know, Western Europe isn't one of them for some of the reasons that we discussed already and some coal burning in Poland and, and Turkey without, you know, real strong controls. Uh, but the place where things are worst, you know, is generally India, you know, Mongolia and, and China. You know, that, that, that's where things are tough in terms of uh, exposures. So let's take a look. So these three graphics start to look at the situation in China. And it kind of relates to this question of can you really decouple or should you decouple the local pollution problem from the greenhouse gas pollution? And the left-hand graph you know, kind of looks, uh, is an index of what's happened since 2010 with uh, the top line is GDP, so it's grown a lot uh, relative to 2010. Uh, the next line is uh, CO2 emissions, which have grown but have kind of leveled off. Uh, the next line is, is coal. I actually think it's a little, little peak here at the front that I think the coal data that I've seen is, but it's, it's roughly right. And then you look at things like NOx, carbon monoxide, direct emissions of particulate matter and emissions of sulfur dioxide. I should point out that NOx and sulfur dioxide are precursors of secondary particulate PM 2.5. So they interact in the atmosphere with other things and create more PM 2.5. But if you look at this thing, you see that while GDP, CO2, and coal use were going up, you know, NOx, carbon monoxide, particulate direct emissions, and SOx, really dropping pretty dramatically in China. China took a very, you know, people were pretty annoyed about what was going on there. And the government, you know, kind of kind of took action. And if you look at the, uh, the upper right-hand graph, you know, this focuses on the chain, on what happened in coal-fired power generation. And you can see that uh, around 2010, where, where that one begins, about the middle of the top graph, uh, you know, producing coal-fired power in China was producing about 10 grams of both NOx and SOx per kilowatt hour. And if you look at those of those, the red and the blue lines, and if you look at what's happened since then, I know they're, they're, they're down, you know, between one and two grams per kilowatt hour now. This is the fleet average in China. And that underlies some of this kind of movement that we're seeing here. You know, power plants are really dominant in terms of SOx. They're less dominant in terms of NOx, which, so that's why on the left-hand graph, you don't see the same kind of, you know, it looks like on, on this power plant graph, they're kind of parallel percentage reductions. On the left-hand graph, they're not. And so, you know, it's particularly impressive, uh, although only for coal-fired power plants. Uh, so the lower right-hand graph actually compares sulfur dioxide emissions in 2005 and 2016. And uh, this is done, uh, you know, using a variety of, uh, of emissions data, both, both published data, which people have a lot of doubts about, but also data related to, uh, collected by satellite instruments. There's a, something called an ozone monitoring instrument on NASA's Aura satellite. And the picture, in fact, shown here is the uh, average CO2 vertical column uh, measurement over China for 2005 and 2016 uh, expressed in Dobson units. So I'll let someone else explain, but uh, you know I'll take their word for it. So in other words, this isn't just self-reported data. This is a common, This is actually monitored kind of data. They tried to put different pieces together, and they also flew some airplanes. And I think what you see is something that's, you know, somewhat consistent with, with the previous two figures we talked about. I mean, if you look at sulfur dioxide emissions in China, 
you see a very significant drop uh, between 2005 and 2016. Doesn't mean that things are great, you know. We know they're not great from the, from the first picture we showed. But they, you know, but you can make a significant uh, progress. It's this one, not my computer. So here's India. Uh, so again, on the, on the left-hand side, you're looking more at the PM2.5 emissions. These are the primary PM2.5s, the actual particles that come out of power plants, not the secondary stuff. This is uh, from the uh, Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. Uh, uh, a really interesting think tank in India that I think is, is quite good for me. I, Scene. And this is showing by vintage of plant uh, what the PM2.5 emissions look like. And not surprisingly, they generally look better. You don't have the, you know, the real high emitter plants, those dark colors that are for the older plants, the 50 year old plants, the 40 year old plants, the 30 year old plants. And as you work your way, you know, to the, to the newer plants, you got more of the very low emitting plants. But the same study, which I thought was really interesting, using the same methods, you know, also produced these, these column ozone measurements for SO2 in India in 2005 and 2016. And it's a little bit of a different story, right? On the, on the previous page, you know, there was a big improvement from 2005 to 2016. On this page, things are definitely getting worse. And people who know India know that the coal producing region where also a lot of power plants are located is where that kind of the, the reddish blotch has grown, uh, you know, from uh, 2005 to 2016. So there has been less progress, I think, in, in India on, on these types of strategies. And again, it's a question of what the priority is. I mean, India did have a, does have these plans to do something. I know they've been delayed. There were some things that were supposed to take effect in 2018. You know, they're not, I don't know when it will be. I hear 2021 maybe. Uh, for industry, they've done very little. So again, it, it's, it's the relative weight placed on, on different uh, issues. Oops, wrong way again. To me, right is forward. So the other thing to keep in mind, you know, is that things vary. As I said, that first graphic was a was a, just a picture of everything. Here, if you look at the actual exposures on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, these are by the, the different places within India. So you can see that in uh, Uttar Pradesh and in, and in West Bengal, Bengal, you got these folks you know, with these very dark colors, greater than 90 micrograms per cubic meter exposure on an annual average basis. Really bad. Delhi, really bad. Some other places, better. You know, and then when you look at the, at the causes of it, which is this picture on the right-hand side is only for Delhi, you can see that it's a, it's a mix of things. So again, the, the, the WHO guidance, you know, the, 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 the bar there in Delhi extends up real high, like above 120 exposure relative to a, you know, a standard of, of 10 from the World Health Organization. But the amount of that that actually comes from power plants, so there are really two places where that would come from. One is the actual black bar in the middle there, which is not a huge part of the whole column. And the other is that green bar, which is called secondary PM 2.5. And that is caused, you know, in part, well, it's, it, it's three things that really contribute there. It's sulfur dioxide, it's, which does come from power plants. Uh, it is uh, nitrous oxide, which comes from power plants, but also comes from other things like transport. And it's ammonia, which comes from waste and other type of things. So there is secondary formation, you know, I don't know, maybe a third of it could be related to power plants, rough accounting. So you would add more to the black bar but you would come nowhere near like the whole problem or even the most important part of the problem in Delhi is tied to those emissions. So, you know, again, things to keep in mind. Uh, finally, we can talk about the, the government role in coal production and transport. Again, I'd refer you to the, to, the, to the Brookings study, but 
but you know, Coal India Limited, government-owned corporation, produces 84% of India's direct coal. Uh, you know, they're very heavily involved. There's a lot of government revenue. There's a lot of revenue that goes to certain states. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of employment. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, China also has really a, a significant role in, in coal prices and coal markets, a lot of role of state oil enterprises, a lot of direct regulation of the production process to bend the markets. You know, in the U.S., the government really doesn't play a big role except in leasing uh, in the West, which accounts for about 40% of our coal production. Uh, so in the U.S., you know, governments are much less involved, although they do have a role in permitting transportation infrastructure. But there are important differences there. And the government role in electricity markets also varies. So, you know, I, I think governments at all level in China and India play a very big role. Uh, you know, the federal role in the U.S. is pretty small, but the state role in the U.S. is, is pretty big. And the states have really taken the lead in mandating a lot of renewables and trying to rescue nuclear in, in doing those types of things. Oh my goodness, I think I've gone too long. And I haven't even gotten to the forecast. Well, I'll stop then. I'll go right to the forecast, and then I'll shut up, and I'll listen to Nick. It's good that I looked at the, at the clock. So coal projections. I don't get too deep in this, but uh, those of you familiar with the IEA knows that they have sort of a new policies scenario, which is sort of what people have taken on, even though they haven't necessarily enacted it. So it would include like their Paris commitments. Uh, there's a current policy scenario, which is kind of law, you know, what's enacted, and there's a supposedly based on what's enacted, and there's a sustainable development scenario, which is kind of what would it take to achieve our goals. Paris goals, one of the goals they look at. Uh, energy availability, uh, modern energy availability is a goal they look at. Reduction of local pollution is a goal they look at. Comes out of the sustainable development program and the energy related goals in there. So those are their three scenarios. I mean, the first, the third one is really a working backwards scenario. You know, from if we want to do this, this is how we might do it. And so, you know, overall for coal use, uh, the NPS is going to have lower coal use than the CPS because it includes some of these commitments in Paris and other things that have been made. But really, IEA sees a very flattish kind of, uh, you know, flat to a slow decline in the, you know, in, in the, or a slow rise in the CPS scenario and, and flattish in the NPS scenario. Just focus on the compound annual rate of growth in the last column. Uh, you know, for China uh, and the U.S., it's a drop. Uh, in the uh, NPS scenario, uh, increase for India. In the CPS scenario, China goes positive. The United States stays negative, which I think is widely, you know, expected. The United States could be negative. Again, the United States is only in the electricity sector, and coal is really getting the, the Jesus beaten out of it. Uh, only in the SDS do you have these big drops across. Uh, you know, all three countries. So that's like the IEA world. Uh, again, this is just a picture of total, what happens to electricity generation and generation using coal. Uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that coal use doesn't necessarily follow generation using coal, because where coal plants are being added, they're generally more efficient. So that gives you a little coal fire generation can rise more fastly more rapidly than coal use itself. But no big story there. The EIA stuff is very similar. Uh, I mean, one difference I think you would see is that probably uh, out to 2040, the EIA stuff sees somewhat faster reductions uh, in the United States. I've shown two scenarios, because I was always fighting with the people that worked for me when I was at EIA. And I always felt that they uh, had, you know, too too high a price outlook for natural gas built into their reference case. So I kind of forced them to run something called the high oil and gas resource case. And to me, that's like the real 
you know, more like the real one. But you've been seeing that, you know, the compound, the you know, annual, uh, you know, rate of growth in, uh, in coal use really, really drops very dramatically in that high oil and gas resource case in the U.S. And again, we have positive India and uh, a world that looks eerily similar to the EIA uh, projections. Uh, this one here is uh, Bloomberg. I thought it would be, you know, interesting to, to look outside of the official uh, agencies. And I think they see, uh, you know, I say a big, uh, this, is, this is particularly in power. And they see, uh, you know, even quicker shift away from coal-fired power generation than the IEA or the EIA outlooks. They're really not clear about their policy assumptions, which is one thing I think I would always say about uh, Bloomberg. Not clear how its scenarios might be influenced by concerns related to uh, economic factors, energy security, which does seem to play a role in some of these decisions, or local pollution questions. Uh, so the graphic on the, you know, the left side shows that the role of fossil fuels in generation mix, which is above 60% today, declines to less than 30% by 2050, and the coal share falls from about 40% today to about 14% by 2050. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, I think. You know, they're getting 48% of generation at the end by solar and wind. I think that is, talk about something I work on, which is storage. You're gonna really need some significant advances in cost reduction in storage to make something like this work. Again, entirely possible could happen. I would also say that, you know, China certainly now is pursuing a very large effort to to increase its storage capacity. So that can be used for a variety of things, uh, but, but they certainly are bulking up their storage. So that, I think, bodes well for that possibility. And this is their view of, of absolute uh, coal use uh, for power generation. And you know, they see a 57% reduction in the level of coal use for generation between 2017 and 2050. And the absolute decline is 62% in China, 39% in India. You know, this is definitely a lot more than in the IEA new and current policy scenarios or the EIA scenario that uses uh, current policy assumptions. And the Americas and Europe really have, you know, major reductions in coal use, which kind of makes sense. Uh, I guess I want to stop after the next one, uh, just for time, because I think we're better off talking then. So last but not least is the view from McKinsey. Uh, they put out an outlook, too, which focuses on, on different fuels. So starting with the left-hand graph, you know, they see relatively, this is really total energy use, coal's at the bottom. They see relatively slow growth in total world energy use. Uh, you know, growing only about, I think, 14% uh, from 2016 to 2050. Uh, like Bloomberg, they envision a significant decline in coal use to 2050, but not as large. It's about a 40% decline in coal use, uh, if you do the, do the math. And finally, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that, again, unlike Bloomberg, sort of, sort of. I think McKinsey sort of between Bloomberg and the EIA, IEA kind of set of projections. So unlike Bloomberg, they see increases in coal use in India. You know, in 2050, India would be using more coal uh, than it is today. It would be up. I, I can't read the damn thing, but it would be up. I think it says 60 percent in that little green circle under India. And they also see it in some other areas. But they see a, a very big drop in China, which is the second uh, from the end there. They see a 65% drop in China, with a mix between the power sector and other sectors. And so it's a somewhat uh, interesting and, and, and different view. But clearly a lot of the reduction is, again, depending on China. So with that, you know, I was going to say a little bit more 
about the U.S. and a little bit more about steel making, but it's probably better to stop, get some real wisdom from our my colleague, and then you know have a discussion, which is what these meetings are about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nico Stoppel is uh, an adjunct at SICE, but also a senior fellow at CSIS. Uh, he was for a number of years. Uh, head of the gas practice at PFC Energy uh, and advised companies and governments uh, around the world. Uh, since then, he's been a commercial advisor to the Alaska State Legislature, uh, uh, assisting them in planning an LNG project. And uh, Nikos has, has published a number of articles, both on gas and energy economics in general. Uh, and he has a, a, an MA from SICE. What higher, what higher praise? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Will. Thank you, thank you, Howard, for, for this great presentation. Uh, I have very few slides, so I just wanted to uh, mostly add to what Howard said by zooming in particularly on Southeast Asia. Um, before I do that, I wanted to start with a global picture, and uh, this is a, a terrible table because it's very unfair to pick just like two years because you're missing a lot of what happens before and after but I think it's quite telling um, it's a picture from the International Energy Agency on the left is how as a world we generate our energy and on the right is how we generate our electricity and I think what's striking about this picture is that for all the talk about energy transition and the cost of renewables blah 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 over the last 18 years the share of coal in primary energy has gone up uh, and this increase has mostly come at the expense of oil and nuclear. Uh, and then there's been a little bit of an increase in gas and hydro and in other renewables. And if you look at the power sector, uh, essentially what the world has done since 2000, uh, between 2000 and 2018, it's, it's kind of replaced oil with gas. So oil is minus 5%, gas is plus 5 percentage points. And then it's lost a little bit of hydro and a little bit of coal, and that's what renewables have provided. So in a way, everything we've done so far hasn't really decarbonized anything. Um, and so Howard talked about so the US, the India, and the coal and the China part of that story. And so I wanted to focus on the Southeast Asia part of that story. Part of the reason is as Howard articulated really well, is Coal is essentially becoming an Asia story. Uh, that since kind of like the mid 80s, you can see the rest of the world has gone through a couple of phases of a huge decline in coal consumption. And that increasingly everything is driven by the Asia Pacific. Uh, that now about 75% of the coal that is consumed in the world uh, is in the Asia Pacific region. So effectively, if you want to do something about coal, uh, yes, like you can beat up the Germans and all that for political reasons. But at the end of the day, if you don't get a handle on Asia, you're not really gonna get very far. And what I wanted to talk about is that a lot of times when we talk about Asia, we tend to focus either on the China part. So on the left is kind of like China, non-China. On the right is India, sort of everything outside of China. So it's India, uh, which Howard talked about. OECD Asia Pacific, by the way, is still growing. Um, that's essentially Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Um, not driven by New Zealand, uh, in case you were wondering. Um, but then there's the other Asia Pacific part, uh, which is what I want to focus more of my, uh, of my slides on, which seems to be kind of like booming at a, you know, China or India type trajectory, right? And in absolute numbers, obviously the, the, the consumption is still quite low, it's at about 200 million tons of oil equivalent versus about almost 2,000 in, in China, right? So scale-wise, it's, uh, it's not anywhere near either the China or the India consumption. Uh, but it's definitely something that you would uh, start to worry about uh, when you think about the overall consumption of, of, of coal. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of zoom in on that Asia-Pacific region and just kind of have a couple of slides to talk about what's, what's happening there and how I'm thinking about this. One is, uh, on the left-hand side is the consumption 
by fuel uh, for a select number of Southeast Asian countries. Um, and on the right is the fuel mix. So essentially the left divided by the total, okay? So what's interesting to me is if you look on the right, effectively what happened in the 70s and 80s, you were, essentially gas was displacing oil. Obviously oil was still growing, but gas was growing faster. And then kind of like nothing happened in the 80s and 90s. The, the, the fuel mix kind of stayed more or less flat. And then as you went towards the late 90s, early 2000s, you have another wave of switching. In this case, mostly at the expense of oil. The first wave is gas and coal together. But then, one of the things that I find quite worrisome, and anyone who cares about sort of the climate aspects would find worrisome, you sort of see gas sort of hit a peak around the mid 2000s in terms of the share of primary energy and actually start to decline. So effectively, in these terms, again, everything is growing because the, the denominator is growing, the primary energy is growing, so everything is growing. But in terms of fuel shares, essentially the region is going, is switching from gas to coal. Essentially that is what that, that is, is showing. Um, which is not great from a carbon perspective, it's not great from a particular matter perspective, Howard talked about some of the air quality issues. Um, I was looking at this data very recently and the World Health Organization says that 4.2 million people died in 2016 because of ambient air pollution and sort of two thirds of those were in Asia, right? Um, you look at the worst cities, as Howard talked about, in terms of particular matter, 2.5 pollution and 85% of them are in Asia, right? And it's not just India and China, uh, it's other countries as well. And the thing that I find interesting is this is the, the share of energy that comes from gas versus coal. And the reason I like this chart is this looks very orderly, right? It's almost like people kind of got together and said, let's do coal. Um, and the reality is that that's not really what happened. Um, what you see though is if you look at the green part, which is the gas, what I see it kind of like as a gas person is whatever the long-term trajectory is and whether you've, you stabilize at 20% or 60%, the last five, 10 years is down. Sometimes the last 20 years is down, right? So Bangladesh, down. Indonesia, down. Malaysia, down. Pakistan, down. Philippines, down. Sri Lanka doesn't use gas. Thailand, down. Vietnam, down. Right? So in every part of this region, the share of energy that comes from natural gas is going down. Right? And sometimes the replacement is, is uh, coal. Sometimes it's not. But a lot of times the replacement is is cold. And I think some of the challenges that we face in dealing with this, uh, in this, with this question is, you know, many countries in this region essentially have historically been either net exporters of, ga of gas or so self-sufficient in gas. And so they haven't really been able to manage the transition to imports uh, in a way that preserves the share of gas, right? That gas is more expensive and therefore they can't really uh, consume gas at the same level as before. Um, one data point that I love to talk about is if you look, say, at LNG consumption over the last six years, half the growth in demand in LNG came from China. Half the growth. Now, if you read the annual report of PetroChina, they tell you that they lose money on every, on, on every source of imports of gas to the country. They lose money on pipeline gas from Central Asia, they lose money on pipeline gas from Myanmar, and they lose money on LNG. So if you're trying to make gas part of the solution, if you're selling a product that's losing money, there's only so much you can do, right? So unless there is a policy driver, as Howard described in China, where you kind of have an overriding, maybe air pollution concern, it's really hard for gas to compete. The other thing that's been happening is, because of the advice that everyone is giving these countries, uh, there's a lot of price reform taking place. 
So the Malaysians have been told for years, and Petronas will tell the Malaysian government, the price of gas is very cheap, you have to increase the price, increase the price, increase the price. Well, when you do that, gas 10 years ago was cheaper than coal, 25% cheaper than coal. Now it's 20% more expensive than coal, right? So yes, you get price reform and you're more aligned with what the IEA and the World Bank tell you the pricing structure should be, but then coal becomes a lot more, um, more competitive. And so you have a challenge, uh, a challenge with that. Uh, and the other part, of course, is um, for a lot of these countries, you know, one of the things that's striking when you compare uh, U.S. coal, the graph that Howard showed in terms of coal versus gas pricing, you know, in the U.S., the price of coal is relatively stable. It kind of goes up and down a little bit. For a lot of these countries, it doesn't. It's like the wild west. It's really very high, very low, exposed to international markets. Uh, so it's not necessarily that you're buying this really nice, cheap commodity over the long term. That's not the experience at all. Uh, but it is uh, a lot of times more attractive than gas. So just to finish up here, um, to an extent, to a large extent, when we talk about coal, we really have to be talking about Asia. Even though, yes, there are still pockets of coal consumption in the US and Europe, even in the former Soviet Union, uh, Turkey, Kazakhstan, uh, Ukraine, these are places that still consume coal. Uh, but really, if you want to get a handle on this at the global level, it's about Asia. And I don't think it's fair to continue to talk about this problem or this challenge fundamentally in purely China and India terms, because it's a much broader consumption, uh, consumption base. A lot of it is driven by cost, but as, as Howard alluded to, it's not just cost. Um, in a lot of these countries, there's a desire to sort of utilize local resources. So this idea that we have it, we should use it. Um, in Indonesia, that's very pervasive. In Pakistan, which is now boosting its coal use, there's sort of this sense that if you don't use the coal, it's going to be wasted. Um, and so that's creating, creating an impetus. And also for some of these countries, you know, there is an energy security and diversification concern. Like if your energy is coming 60% from gas and you're no longer self-sufficient in gas, uh, using coal, even if it's imported coal, could provide a measure of energy security because it's diversifying your fuel mix. It's the same case with, uh, with Thailand that kind of like built up a coal industry even though it was still using, uh, using gas. Uh, and so, in a way, you have to find a solution to provide energy to these countries uh, that still are in a really, happy, really rapid growth path if you want to address this. The last thing I'll say, which is sort of the positive side of, there's kind of like 20 seconds of positivity at the end of you know, 10 minutes of grim. Um, the one thing I'll say is that what we've learned from the United States, but we've also learned in, uh, in Europe, particularly the UK, is that when an alternative source becomes competitive, the decline in coal can be quite dramatic uh, unless politicians step in to stop it, right? Or if politicians are willing to accelerate it, right? So you look at the US, the decline in coal use was about 40% over a decade. If you look at the IEA sort of Paris numbers, coal use in the world, and, and, and Howard showed these numbers, has to basically fall by about 60% between now and 2040. Right? So it's not, if you, do, if you find a way to deliver energy uh, to these countries at a lower cost, I don't think it's fair to just assume that because a power plant got built, it's baked in forever and has to produce for 40, 50, 60 years. That's not really our experience. Uh, it's only that if you can't find an alternative or if the political economy is such that it prevents that alternative from really undercutting coal. Uh, so I think it's a challenge that we have is both an economic challenge in terms of finding cheaper source of energy, but also a political economy challenge to find a way to essentially strand these assets and provide sort of a support network uh, around, if you're gonna strand these assets, that creates a lot of economic and job security and trouble that you have to manage. Uh, so I think that's how I read the challenge. But as you can see, it's pretty, it's pretty widespread. It's not just about sort of China and India. So with that, I'll stop. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank our speakers here. Uh, the floor is open for questions or comments. Yes. Could you tell us more about the coal and steel making? 
Oh, well, so steel making, a couple of things. I mean, it's metallurgical coal. It's actually more valuable than thermal coal. Uh, clearly, China was producing about half of the world's steel and using tremendous amounts of met coal. Uh, India is expected to produce a lot more steel. India is moving up, I think, is likely to become the, the number two steel maker very in the next year or two or three. Uh, currently, China, half the world, followed by Japan, then by India, then by the United States. So again, China, India, United States are three out of the top four. Uh, but in the United States, something like 68% of the steel, I think, is currently electric, electric arc furnace steel, which doesn't really use met coal. And in China, 90% of the steel is basic oxygen furnace steel, which does use met coal. India is sort of in between there. Uh, more electric steel share than China, but less than uh, the United States. As I already said, although they have a lot of thermal coal, they don't have any net coal, so they're maybe less attracted to going down that path. The other thing that affects it is the amount, even in the basic oxygen furnace, you can use different amounts of scrap you know, as part of the charge. And the more scrap you use, the less met coal you need. And uh, you know, China increased its steel production very rapidly between like 2000 and 2015. It was really, truly amazing. And honestly, they didn't have the, when you drive in the American countryside, you see all these junk cars and all these things that have piled up for, you know, stuff that will be the source of scrap. And I think China really needed to increase steel production from a situation where they didn't have a lot of scrap. So, you know, <coughs> you're gonna find, I think, more scrap being used even in the basic oxygen furnace technology in the world. So those are some of the kind of factors. The other thing is how fast world steel will actually grow. Uh, you know, the OECD steel committee sees significant slowdown in steel growth. Uh, you know, I think they have to 2035, their outlook is something like 1.1% compound annual growth in steel. So again, it'll be important in places where steel's going to grow, like India. I think in China, steel production is actually kind of, has plateaued and is kind of level. Good. Other questions? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, could you discuss the, um, like if there was like a coal miner in the room and they were wondering about their job security over the next 20 years in the United States, like who would you say to them about an outlook? So the number of coal miners has fallen, you know, we have to realize is that they're, gosh, when I, when I, yeah, I mean, yeah. we'll describe my career. And when I first went to work for Carter, there was this big battle about the Clean Air Act of 1977. I was a young guy like you. I was, you know, and, and, and people were really having it out over this. And there might have, you know, there was a lot more coal employment in the country then. A lot of the loss in coal mining jobs, in some sense, has already occurred. Uh, again, that doesn't make things, you know, very happy for coal mining workers. The other thing is I think you'll find that the coal mining labor force has gotten older and people do not, although they're good, very good, very high paying jobs, you know, they do not necessarily encourage, uh, one does not necessarily encourage one's children to, uh, to you know, want to take on those jobs. So there will be some natural retirement. I think a, a bigger challenge than the employment itself may be the coal mining communities. You know, if you, if you own a house in a community where the whole purpose of the community, you know, its location is determined by the location of a coal seam and that, and that you know, that coal seam stops being worked, you, you know, you, you really do have a problem. The, the whole community can collapse and the value of the community can collapse and it can make it very hard to, to have mobility. So it is, it is a really challenging issue. You know, in some places like West Virginia, uh, where there's been a very big boom in natural gas as part of the Marcellus, you know, 
Utica play. There's been talk about moving people from, you know, coal mining to, to, nat to natural gas industry. But it, but in some in some you know in some ways the the you know it's just remote remote, and that, and that can be difficult. You know, it doesn't always work out. But you're talking on the order of eighty thousand people. So that's what the current kind of level of coal mining employment is, I believe, roughly. And, you know, we're talking about an economy that has an employment total something like 130 billion or maybe even more. So it, it's, a, it's a serious problem and you're right to think about it. You know, there aren't that, you know, economists often say things like, gee, we could pay every coal miner, you know, $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year and send them to the Bahamas, you know, and that sounds like a smart aleck economist kind of answer, not, not like a real, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging situation. A contributing factor to that, I guess, is uh, coal mining has gotten into more advanced technology over the years, so production uh, efficiency has increased, which Mean fewer, fewer workers. Yeah. Uh, and that's a secondary factor. Yes, Doug. Doug Hangel, an adjunct uh, here at, at SLICE as well. I was struck by the cold liquids numbers there in China. How economic is that? Yes. Or is that being done uh, by government? Leader, government leadership and I damn, think, damn the cost. Well, again, I mean, I think there is a significant, you know, there is a, I think some kind of energy security concern is motivating that. You know, China is also going really going huge on something that the United States once did in terms of building strategic reserves. So you can look at coal to liquids, building strategic reserves. You know, uh, really. I think the, the push for electric vehicles is like a triple win in, in China, you know, in terms of energy security, in terms of local pollution, in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, which I'm sure, you know, I'm not saying, not taking issue with Will, you know, but I, mean, I think greenhouse gas reduction is really important, but, but I think when these things come into conflict with each other, you know, in, in the case of, that's why I particularly Cold liquids is, even though it's tripling, it's not huge, but it does show a clear place where people are spending more money to produce more greenhouse gas emissions than they would need. Do you have any idea of what the cost of production is on, like, on a barrel basis or anything like that? I don't know if those specific plants, but I, I know it's, it's, it's really, I mean, the only other place that had significant cold liquids, you know, was South Africa, which had a, an embargo problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that was clearly a national security thing. And even the gas to liquids, which is a, an easier technology, which was pursued in places like the Middle East, especially like places that had uh, gutter that had like, you know, condensate and they produced gas as a byproduct and the gas was virtually free. And even the economics of those plants is not great. So I don't think the economics of, is very good. Uh, I think you got to look at that one as a, as a for better or worse. I don't know that it really provides a lot of energy security, but I, I, I look at that as an energy security kind of motivation. Uh, Nico, let me ask you a question. Uh, if you could maybe just to repeat, uh, of those countries you were talking about uh, in, in Asia that seem to be uh, wrapping up coal use, which are, are the most significant? I guess Vietnam is one, is that right? Yeah, so it kind of depends on whether you look at it on an absolute basis or a growth basis yeah. and also what period of time. Um, so if you look at the last 10 years, the growth in uh, coal use, uh, the countries are in this order, China, India, South Korea, Vietnam, right? Um, if you look at it in terms of overall energy use, uh, Indonesia is the biggest uh, is the biggest consumer. Um, so um, I'm trying to think of the countries in between. I don't have that off the top of my uh, of my head, um, but 
it, it was actually quite interesting just the extent to which Vietnam over the last 10 years, uh, that delta is actually quite, quite significant. Uh, good following this question. Um, I'm interested with Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, I know that they produce or export a lot of LNG or natural gas, and I'm just curious, uh, is Petronas the only major supplier for Malaysia? Is that why they have a lot of say um, with the government telling them sort of how to price? Um, and how can that change? I mean, I think they would take issue with the idea that they have, they have as much say as you suggest. They've been trying to get higher prices in Malaysia for a very long time, uh, and the Malaysian government didn't really want to do that. Um, so, I mean, I think that the, the challenge for both Indonesia and Malaysia, so both of them are uh, still net exporters of gas. Uh, in both of them, the amount of gas that they're exporting as a share has been declining. Um, both of them are now have import facilities. Indonesia still mostly does Indonesia to Indonesia LNG trade, not imports. Uh, Malaysia actually does have uh, imports. So I think of it more as a question of recognizing that a lot of these gas industries were built on very cheap domestic gas. And the fact that once you no longer have this cheap domestic gas, you kind of need to change your pricing system. Um, some of these countries have been doing it in a much more orderly, long-term way. So Thailand has kind of like the more poster child of how price reform should work, where they're putting sort of different streams of gas together, and they have different pricing for different sectors that are more against competing fuels. Um, the uh, Malaysians have actually been a lot kind of like slower in terms of increasing prices, so like flat for a very long time, and then it kind of shoots up, so there's a little bit of an adjustment challenge. Um, Indonesia is kind of like all over the place, um, depending on which sector you're looking at. Uh, but if you look at like the Indonesians, the LNG that they're trading up within the country, the pricing for that LNG is actually quite, quite good. Uh, part of it is also the fact that gas is doing well in some of these places, not necessarily in the power sector, uh, but in industry. You still have sort of industry where you're competing directly with oil. Uh, you're much better off sort of having an inroad there. Uh, so there is a kind of like a pricing, even like, you know, if you look at uh, India, there's kind of like about six different gas markets, and gas is doing really poorly in some, like power, but it's doing much better in others. So, so th there is a little bit of that segmentation that you see in different parts. Right, so in India, you have a lot of gas-powered vehicles in some of the urban, you know, Delhi and some of those areas dealing with some of them. Problems and you also have industry, right? It's a pretty attractive yeah. gas market. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, tell, thank us, tell, yeah. tell us who you are. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, today's a very impressive uh, discussion for Colin and Outlook. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, attend uh, today's discussion. So I'm from the Japanese uh, uh, National Corporation to the Oil and Gas and uh, Good Coal. And that's, I have also the one question so that uh, related to so the uh, influence of the introducing the CCS and CCUS uh, will be uh, will make a positive impact or negative impact for the so the share of electricity in the by coal fuel plant. So because uh, in the United States, so the expecting for the CCUS and the CCS is now it is increasing. I know and. Uh, uh, so sometimes as uh, the United States administration uh, is encouraged to uh, so introduce the CCS and the CCS. But uh, however, the CC if the, so the uh, CCS and the CCS will be introduced, uh, it also uh, needed much more cost for the uh, plant. But uh, uh, for the clean or the, so the for the uh, adapted to the climate change issue. So I'm just, uh, I like to ask a question. But may I give you a positive impact? Do I want to talk about CCUS first? A little bit. So all I would say is I think CCUS probably in, in the US would be, on a coal plant, would be very, diff very difficult. Let, let's define what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, sorry, carbon capture 
uh, CCS is carbon capture and sequestration, and CCUS is carbon capture utilization and sequestration. So if you, if you would pump the carbon into, say, an oil and gas field and use it to increase oil and gas production, that would be CCUS. The idea is that you can use the carbon, not just store it. But in the, you know, in the U.S., you have very, you have very cheap natural gas. Uh, you have very old existing coal plants, mm -hmm. and I, there is a question as to whether one would ever add something as expensive as CCUS to a coal plant that is already very, very old. It's like if you're deciding to put a new transmission into your car. If your car is two years old and it needs it, you might do it. But if your car is 20 years old and it needs a new transmission, you'll probably go get a new car. And so I think, and in the case of the US, it probably won't be a coal-fired car. So in the US, it's hard. I think in the four coal plants, I think it, it is possible in the US to see, uh, there's some really interesting cycles, uh, like the alum cycle. If, if, in Texas, there's a plant that runs on a power plant, 50 megawatt, so not not tiny, demonstration plant. Uh, it's almost commercial scale. The next one would be 350 megawatts, which is really commercial scale, that runs on supercritical CO2 as the working fluid. And potentially there, you get a you, you use natural gas, you burn it with oxygen, you get a pure stream of CO2. And that kind of cycle might happen in the US, but a lot depends on the, the carbon pricing. You know, that's gonna be pretty important. And it's also gonna have to compete with renewables coupled with storage. So there's a lot of moving parts, but one, I, I think it's hard to envision for coal plants in the US it might be easier, my analogy of the car, you know, in, in, in Asia, you probably have a lot of would-be two-year-old cars. Yeah. And there, again, with the proper, with the price put on carbon, one might see a, a sort of a CCUS solution with coal. But again, that raises the bigger question of how you know, how important greenhouse gas reduction is versus other things. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very good question, and, it, and there's no easy answer, except I think in the United States you probably won't see it on coal plants. You will see it other places. You will see it on ethanol plants. You'll see it on hydrogen plants, potentially. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting issues surrounding CCUS. If I can add one thing only, um, I agree with everything that Howard said. The, the question, that goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question for me is, you know, you basically have the cost generated electricity from a coal plant. Do you want to build a CCS or CCUS, either to it or when you build a new one? That raises the cost. And if you're going to do that, how do you pay for that? you know, is it is the carbon tax, or if you raise the cost of electricity, why would you do that rather than just doing gas or, or renewables? The, the way I always thought of, of CCS in this context is, it, it does allow you to get out of some of the political economy challenges, right? So you could, in theory, say, hey, if I do CCS, the price of electricity goes up, I might as well do solar, wind, batteries, and gas, but if I do that, I'm gonna destroy my coal industry and strand a lot of capital and put a lot of people out of work. And I don't wanna do that. So therefore, CCS kind of like allows you to meet some of your climate and air pollution targets without some of those sort of second order externalities. I mean, we've seen in uh, Germany just kind of how difficult it is to, coal, to close down the coal industry, uh, right, and sort of the example that you gave was like, oh, you can just pay people off, even even with paying people off. I was off. joking. <laughs> I know, but like, 
even with that mindset, it's it's still very yeah, challenging very and very hard to do, right? They so, don't take lessons from the nuclear industry in Germany. They seek to manage to close that then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but so so I've always thought of, of CCS as providing kind of like that. And at the end of the day, it's going to come down to you know what's the cost and all that. But um, it is one of those areas that you know it provides a, a significant chunk of the of the reduction in CO2 emissions, say like the IA output, that a share of the of the coal and the gas used is subject to CCS out of 2040. And so the way I always think of it is if you don't have it, then all the numbers that the IA puts out have to be that much lower to offset the fact that you don't have CCS. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. So um, I, it's been really interesting to see that there's a global demand for coal um, still, and that's increasing. But in many of the countries that you also talked about, um, there's also an increasing push to transition fully to renewable energy and other new energy technologies. So I'm, uh, I mean, I would be interested to know what uh, the countries. Um, that you talked about, especially the smaller countries that are not China and India, like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, what they could do to make, and how realistic is it for them to transition from coal to renewable um, energy, and how soon do you think that could happen? Uh, I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's a couple ways to to think about this, or a couple ways that I think of this. One is. It does seem to me that if you take a more holistic picture of coal, if you add you know, 4.2 million people dying every year from ambient air pollution into your level as cost of electricity number, if you take a broader view of coal, I think you, you realize that maybe you're not getting as much of a bargain as you thought. Um, and so I think that's one part of having a better conversation in terms of just because you see on a piece of paper that the cost of electricity is lower, it doesn't mean you have to go for that option because you're gonna pay for that low cost at some point uh, later on. Uh, I think that's one. Uh, the second one is I think you still need to both bring down the cost but also bring the capital required for renewable energy sources. Uh, there's a part of that story that's not just about cost but is about you know, how you integrate renewables in the grid and how do you uh, run electricity markets that actually can incentivize and incorporate renewables. I mean, even in the United States and in Europe, which have been at this for much longer, we're kind of still at that level of like scratching our heads around like how do you really, uh, because we have an electricity system that's not particularly well suited to zero marginal cost of electricity. So there are some broad questions about electricity design and. and and, and so I think for a lot of these countries, it's not just about copying what the West did, but trying to figure out how to avoid the mistakes of the West and incentivize renewables. Um, in terms of how quickly things can happen, I'm a believer in, uh, you know, the energy system doesn't change until it does. And when it changes, it changes dramatically, right? So, you know, I, I live in a world where people talk about energy as being this big, slow system while at the same time they'll talk about the shale gas revolution that changed everything within 10 years and it killed coal within 10 years. Um, so that 10, 15 year period is, is the period that we can actually do a lot of stuff. Uh, but you can only do a lot of stuff if you're kind of like working at it or if the economics are very compelling. It's not just, the inertial state is not pointing you to you towards a lower carbon future, which is, you know, as, as I showed in the beginning and also as Howard showed in terms of it, the new policies or, the, or even the, the current policies, you know, nine of them are pushing you towards a, a, a lower carbon future. So you've got to do something different than that. All right, that uh, let me ask the last question, maybe to Howard. Of the, of the countries that you talked about, it sounds like India is really the larger problem going forward. If, if you take it that China has made pledges and is beginning to reduce coal consumption gradually, but India is not. Uh, how does one solve that problem? Well, I'll 
you know, there's, it's, 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 like, it's like a budget problem in the federal government for a small agency. It's like, you know, budgets are going to be cut. Well, in general, budgets can be cut, but I can swim the other direction. You know, so, I mean, I'm not sure that that the that the world salute, you know, the world solution in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, you know, has to see a cut in every you know source of of carbon dioxide emissions in every single country. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that's you know it's really likely to to happen. I mean, I guess the way you really solve it is when the, the economics get like, you know, if the economics were to get extremely compelling for renewables and storage, I think that that can really make a big difference. It's just like, like the world went from, you know, telecommunications used to have these big copper cables, you know, and then, you know, fiber optics got invented, right? You, you don't need an, a, a framework convention on fiber optics to get people to put that stuff in, right? You had people ripping up the streets and putting it in as fast as they could and abandoning the, you know, it's like, it's like Nico says, and abandoning the, you know, abandoning the old technology because it was just, you know, and so it didn't live its, 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 its normal lifetime, you know, as you say, I think Nico and I have similar views. So I think part of the answer might be a, you know, one of the things that would change it in India would be a super compelling economic case. But one thing to keep in mind, and I didn't talk about it at length, although I talked at length, is that you know you do have these these even if you got that, you have these you know the whole the whole railway tariffs for everything else, including passengers, is subsidized by coal transport. The whole you know some of these individual states that are coal mining states in India and even the federal government rely heavily on the sector for revenue. You know, the CIL itself produces, Coal India Limited produces 85% of the coal. You know, it's a part of the government. So you really have some challenges that were even if, you know, the, 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 the economics were compelling, you're probably going to have some people you know, fighting to maintain this dirty fuel that's killing 4.2 million people a year. So it's, 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 really, it's really challenging. But I think the world can progress. You know, you know I, I think it's, the question is, can the world progress? You know, I think it's more the answer than trying to get every country regardless of its circumstances. I, I kind of sound like the, I go back in the framework convention negotiations a really long way. And I, and I remember there was a, what was this, common but differentiated, uh, you know, you responsibility and, and, uh, and, and who has to do what. And I think the developing world has come a long way in terms of, I think, understanding that it ain't just going to be the, the OECD countries, you know, and that whole split in the Kyoto Protocol between Annex 1 and the rest and the whole, but but that said, I don't think you can really try to line up everybody to take an equal Procrustean bed, right? Procrustes was the guy who they kind of, if your legs were too long and they stuck over the end of the bed, the adjustment was made by cutting off your legs, not lengthening the bed. I think you're going to have to make some accommodations. You know, you don't have to go back to the bad old days of the Kyoto Protocol where the developing countries did nothing. But the notion that they're gonna, you know, cut their absolute level of coal use every country, I don't know. Do you want to hold out for that? You, you may have to hold your breath a long time. Okay. Uh, let's uh, maybe close on that point. And uh, <laughs> we do have a little reception if you could stay on for a few more minutes uh, for a glass of wine. But thanks again to our speakers for, for doing a great job. Thank you.